Good evening and welcome to another edition of Down to the Wire. I'm your host, Derbyologist, and joining me again this weekend is Camping with Candace. Candace here, and Candace, we're going to kind of do some different races this weekend. We've got a two-year-old race from Santa Anita, and then we'll go to Evangeline Downs, which I don't think we've graced their presence yet on Down to the Wire. So first off, um, kind of an interesting two-year-old race, and I noticed in, in this race at Santa Anita on Friday, a lot of horses with um, first crop sires being represented. Yeah, I didn't even notice that So you said it, but I guess you're right there. With uh, We have Morris Reward, and we have looking at Lucky, and a few of those. Um, I was intrigued by this race first off because a lot of these horses came from the same sale. A lot of them came from the Keeneland September Yearling sale, which is pretty interesting. But um, yeah, we're at Tenanita, two-year-old. We've, ha we've only done a couple two-year-old races on here before. And but we have seen one of the runners here with Tiz Jolie, who I think we both were kind of keen on in her last start, and you know just did, didn't really get there. It was uh, a well-beaten third, but she's back here. As is, we talked about Social Request, who is by looking at Lucky, um, but I think he scratched from that race. He didn't end up running, but we did talk about him there. Um, for me, neither of those are are who I'm on here. Um, there's a, there's a few horses in here with nice pedigrees, but I'm just not sure that they want to win um, early. A horse like Red Button uh, stood out to me on pedigree. Um, you know, he's by Distorted Humor. Um, out of skipping around, uh, he, I, I just like the, um, the pedigree there for routing, but I'm not sure that he really wants to win first time out. Um, for me, the horse who I really settled on here is Bull Bid. Um, he's by Pulpit, out of My Magic Moment, who... Uh, she was pre she was pretty precocious herself as, as a two year old, and uh, you know it just looking at his work pattern, he fired a bullet two works back. It just seems like he's working more quickly than a lot of these. And like I said, many of the horses here they came from the Keeneland September yearling sale, but he came from the OBS March two year old in training sale, and so I just think he's really you know tuned up from that and is ready to go first time out of the gate. Um, he he uh, worked uh, one eighth there in uh, ten and one fifth seconds, so he was pretty fast. And uh, you know his pedigree just kind of suggests to me that he's ready to win early. His first down, my magic moment, had two wins at, at two years old, one of which was a stake. So you know for me, bold bid is really the one to look at uh, here. It just everything, the fact that he worked so quickly at a, at you know a pretty recent two year old in training cell. His damn one early. Uh, Peter Miller is really good with his first 10 stars and with two year olds. So to me, he's kind of the standout. Yes, I agree with you. I think Bold Bit is very logical on, on a lot of the reasons you mentioned, especially being a March sale graduate, which means, you know, they pumped some speed into him and got him ready for the sale. They got a nice price, and Peter Miller is good with them. I did want to talk about a couple of these first crop sires. You know, looking at Lucky is going to have a big crop this year. Um, it's well over 100 foals, and a lot of people may not remember, he was very precocious, um, kind of had a tough beat in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile on synthetic. Otherwise, he had one of the better and longer juvenile campaigns we've we've had in about the last 10 years. He actually ran quite a few races and was uh, very quick to come around as a juvenile, and then had a strong three-year-old race uh, campaign that... Most people actually remember him as the horse that was, this was kind of really when the dreaded rail came into effect, when looking at Rut Lucky drew the rail in his derby, and a lot of people after that race thought he was the best horse, and then he came back and ran a couple of big races after that. So I, I think overall, you know, with that big crop of mares, I think he's going to have a lot of winners this year, and he was kind of a smaller horse, um, and so I think his foals are going to develop quickly. So... I'm not so sure about this one. Uh, the reason why he did have to scratch after being entered in that first race was because that uh, they had forgot to file the paperwork, so his uh, official thoroughbred papers weren't in with the racing office. Um, another one to watch is Munnings. I noticed uh, he's got a one here called Om, um, and Munnings was another horse that was trained by Todd Pletcher, uh, a fast son of Spacetown, and one of the things with Spacetown is he really developed into a hundred thousand dollar sire after kind of just rising up through the ranks and it'll be interesting to see now if he's going to become a sire of sires uh, so I think those are some horses I will be watching this summer from the first crop I ended up going with a horse called Masters Circle in this race 
couple of years ago, Stormy Atlantic had a lot of early winning first-time starters, and I just have a sneaky feeling I like the, the pedigree on this one, the sale price, and, and I just think on the inside he, he drew well and he gets Mike Smith. So Master's Circle is kind of my choice here. Yeah, I mean, a few others we didn't talk a lot about either. Um, Doug O'Neill has one, Valerie Sanchez, and I gave a long, hard look. He's by Warriors Reward, who maybe has been kind of the red-hot sire of first-time starters early on this season. Um, you know, he's had some fast work, so... You know, you could definitely make a case for him here, I think, though. I mean, I don't know about you. When I looked at his pedigree on just first glance, I, I really thought that it, he might be a good turf horse down the road. I agree with you, though. Overall, I think, you know, Peter Miller might have this barrel over a bunch with bold bid. I do think the horse to watch, or maybe the horse with the most potential, is the horse that you mentioned, that red button. Um, kind of surprising to me see him entered in a five furlong race. Um, in the middle of June, so um, who knows? Maybe you know, maybe they're just kind of getting a couple of runs of him. But I think he could potentially be a horse to watch uh, later on this summer and into the fall with that pedigree. Now we're going to go to Evangeline Downs and kind of a mixture. We got a nice mile race, and then we go to the turf race. The interesting thing with Evangeline Downs is a lot of these horses are are pretty well known. There's some older kind of some hard knocking horses and. Sunbeam, you know, he's just a Louisiana bred that against his own type of horses, he's pretty tough. That he is, but at the on the same token, he seems to uh, struggle a bit when he gets into open company. And I'm not necessarily sure that a mile is his best trip. I think maybe like a mile and a sixteenth is really what he wants. Um, but he'd be hard for me to take here, just considering how he's done against open company. I don't think that... That is necessarily his strength by any means. He, but he does do very well against Louisiana Breads. Um, for me, this is a, a tough race because I found it really tough to go against Grand Contender, and he's going to be a pretty much unbettable price here. Um, but he's just—I mean, he's won like three in a row. Uh, yeah, three in a row. I mean, two of them were over off track, so you know, take that for what it will a little bit. But the the one in between the Texas Mall was a nice race. Uh, he beat Tap Town for Urban Courage. I mean, those are tougher than what I think he's facing here. You know, he's run against Brave Sir for Dubai. Just it's you know it, this is kind of a dropping class for him compared to what he's been running against this year. And and the ones he's been running against this year, he's done well against anyway. So I think you're going to be hard pressed to beat him here. Um, the price is just a little bit unfortunate. <laughs> For me, I see a lot of speed in the race, and so I'm going to kind of take a horse that's been chasing some of these horses, and his name is Runaway Steven. Uh, he's chased Grand Contender around the track, and if you notice, when he does kind of close, uh, he he's, can put in a big run from 5, 6, even 10 lengths back, and I see Grand Contender as speed. I also see Sunbeam as some speed. Um, there's a couple of other horses on the inside I think might want to go a little bit, uh, so I'm kind of hoping for a pace duel. I like Runaway Steven if that develops. Another horse who, you know, his most recent races are kind of interesting just from a form cycle. If you noticed, uh, Call to Serve has faced Game on Dude, and then he went against Golden Lad, and then he went against Moonshine Mullen, and nobody at that time knew who Moonshine Mullen was. And then the last race he kind of chased Grand Contender, and he's coming third off a layoff. He may be ready to fire a good shot here. Yeah, I mean, I could definitely see... See that? I just I think they're gonna need. I think any other horse is really gonna need help. They're gonna need that speed duel to formalize, like you're hoping to happen. Um, it could. I mean, I do think like a horse like pushing on a string uh, could get up there with Grand Contender, but I'm I'm a little bit inclined to think that he just has a little bit more early speed than these, um, and the, just the class is there. So uh, it's just I have a hard time looking past Grand Contender. But of the others, uh, I do definitely agree with the ones that ones that you're mentioning. And then for the Evangeline Turf Race, uh, this race is run, being run for the first time and kind of a tricky spot on the calendar. You know, you've got a lot of hard-knocking turfer sprinters across the country, but it seemed to drew a lot of uh, kind of Evangeline, Louisiana, and I know a horse that you've been watching for a while uh, in this turf race. Yeah, I'm, I'm, if you follow me on Twitter, read my blog, you probably know I'm a huge, huge fan of Hay Tide. This is, you know, 
maybe arguably one of like my favorite horse in training in America, which sounds really bizarre that that I would you know follow so closely. He's an older Louisiana bred sprinter, but uh, he's just really cool to watch. I think he's exciting because he's mo, which is kind of go and run him off their feet and hope nobody can catch him. And he's been pretty good, pretty consistent at doing that this year. Um, I'm not going to pick him here. He, he has run once on the turf before at this distance at Evangeline Downs. He did win that race. But this is uh, now his one, two, three, four, five, six race of the season, I think. And he just, to me, he looks like he's tailing off form a little bit. I mean, it's, it's a little hard to say because he's still been winning. But uh, I've seen his speed figures were kind of consistently declining. And I thought in both his last two races that he did look tired at the end. He just kind of had enough lead that he could hold on. But uh, this is his better distance, I think. You know, uh, he kind of does like between five and six furlongs. And I do think he's better at five. He's just going to go out there and run. And I think for him, a lot of this race depends on his start. Um, if he gets a rocket start, then he's going to be kind of tough. But occasionally he'll throw a clunker start in there and that's when he becomes really vulnerable because he will rush to the lead and he can get away with it against the Louisiana bread he wouldn't get away with it in this group though that's for sure um, but like I said he's gonna be a short price and I do just think he's tailing up just a little bit as far as uh, the speed is concerned um, for me I ended up uh, leaning towards some of the parts here um, he's, you know, ran against Tough Company and Marchman and Undrafted and, you know, kind of that group, which is definitely harder, tougher than what we, what we're going to see here. And, you know, I think that he's kind of found uh, a little bit of a home at this distance. This, you know, it's a bit of a drop down in class for him. And I just think he's going to sit right behind uh, Haytai. And if Haytai fades at all in the slightest, which is kind of what he's been doing his last couple of races, I think some of the parts is the horse who's going to you know, have that first jump on everyone else to, you know, get in there and get the wind. Uh, you know, maybe the other horse who would be a big danger is Gantry, but Gantry comes, typically comes from a bit further off the pace than some of the parts does. So I think, you know, it's going to be that jump that he's going to have on him that's going to make the difference here. Um, he's switching back from the, from the synthetic back to the turf, which I think is positive. So for me, uh, I'm leaning towards some of the parts here. I'd love to see Haytai win. Um, I'm just a little bit of afraid of what I've seen from him in his last two runs. Yeah, I think Haytai is going to be up against it here. You know, in his lone turf race, he just got an easy lead and won. Um, you know, he really doesn't have a lot of turf breeding. He's just a fast horse that they put him on the grass and he wired the field. But as, you know, now he's going up in class against open company in a big field of 10 horses. And... Even though normally speed doesn't necessarily fade, I think there's going to be five or six horses at the finish line. I'm leaning towards the closers. I like Lemon Drop Dream a little bit. Uh, three of his last four races, he's had five horse fields. Now he gets a ten horse field to run at, and he's got a little bit of a, you know, he's been racing at the fairgrounds in Oaklawn Park, and I think he'll do okay. I do like Gantry in this spot too. I think he's another horse that needs a ten horse field. Uh, some horses just need horses to run at to kind of soften up and. And so I think High Tide is going to be up against it. Unitas was another horse I kind of looked at a little bit. I thought he had uh, some interesting form and is another horse who could maybe come off the pace if, if the speed kind of collapses. And I think one thing, I'm kind of counting on High Tide to get out there and spread out this field a little bit so that way it can uh, draw him closer at the end. Yeah, um, well, I think that's going to happen. That's, that's usually what he does. Um, and I think, I think he's, you know, his kind of MO is just go and take off and play a little game of catch me if you can. And, you know, this is a classier group. I think the, the last, I think it was the last time he raced in open company. Well, no, he thought he was open company over, was over the turf. He won that race. But the last time I would say he raced, you know, against horses of this quality um, was when he lost pretty badly, actually. Um, Lemon Drop Dream won that race. It, it was a little bit of a close, favorite closer a little bit that day at Oakland Park, but I mean, he was way up against it. He, he almost didn't even push the same horse. Just that step up in class by itself alone there um, really kind of showed everyone what that, you know, he's just not quite up to this rate. He's really great at his level. I'm just not sure that this is necessarily it. Um, one that is worth a mention, though, too, I think, is Snappy, Ta Snappy Girl. Um, comes up with two posts at 15 to 1. This is a horse who's won several races in a row, three races in a row, finished second before that. 
most of them have come against Louisiana breads, but this is a horse who I think clearly enjoys being on the turf. And I know you're looking at the closers, but I'm kind of trying to find the horses who are going to be in that first flight right behind Haytai, and this is one of those horses who fits that bill and could maybe sneak up there to get third. Yeah, Snappy Girl I thought this was a good spot for. She's two for two on the Evangeline turf course, and I think you're right. She's With that second post position, she should be able to tuck in behind the speed, and she should almost get first run. And a lot of times, you know, a few of these horses, you know, shipping to that course for the first time. I also noticed Whiskey Bravo is two for two on that turf course. And, you know, he's another with a high morning line or a higher morning line. And, and you know, I think this is a type of race where you really don't want to take high tie at a low price. I'm not even sure you want to take some of the parts at a lower price, although he definitely has a class edge. He also mm -hmm. has that 10th post position, and I prefer mm -hmm. to, like, inside posts as much as I can in these sprint races on the turf. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I could definitely uh, see where you're coming from with the post position, for sure. Um, for me, I, I think I'm leaning towards some of the parts, so anyway, um, Snappy Girl underneath. I mean, I think High Tide will finish respectively. I could see him anywhere from second to fourth, but uh, my gut tells me he's, he's definitely not going to win here. So overall, you know, it looks like Evangeline put together a pretty good card. I know they're going to have a pick four. Um, are most of the sprinters, the kind of the power sprinters, you know, there's kind of a difference between, I'm surprised none of the Santa Anita horses came, but, you know, again, $300,000 and you got to ship and you got to go, you know, get to the airport and things like that, or are most of the heavy hitters in this race that you expected? Um, I mean, for me, I think that, you know, as far as the horses, we kind of see time in and time out um, over there in that Louisiana area. This is kind of what I would expect, maybe even a little bit better than what I would expect, to be honest, but, you know, I, I can see where you're coming from as far as maybe a little bit of surprise that other horses didn't ship in, but as far as the ones who do race in that area, it seems like most of them showed up. Looking forward to seeing the sprint, and, and turf races are always fun, and I think, you know, Evangeline Downs has got a nice turf course, so I think it'll at least, I think what they really want to do is just kind of showcase their product in the middle of June, and this weekend kind of fit good into the schedule. As you notice, there really wasn't a lot of big races this weekend, so I think handicappers will gravitate towards this card, and and those that like the turf, well, there's a few races at Evangeline to kind of give them a nice pick four, and, and this this race ends it. So it'll be interesting to see Sunbeam against Open Company, and, and then also to see High Tide take on a uh, step up in class. So next week we go out west and out east. We'll try to get a couple of more races in. And then we're only a couple of weeks away from a lot of big racing on the 4th of July weekend this year, including a couple of uh, kind of a revamped card at Belmont that day. So that's going to do it for another edition of Down to the Wire. We will talk to you next week.